Well, hello, everybody. Um, we want to uh, begin our study today, lesson number two. First of all, I'd like to uh, give a little explanation. Um, we did 24 lessons at our Anchor the School of Theology, uh, and now we have uh, 27 more lessons that we want to do here in the studio. Uh, so uh, we didn't do the lessons in order at the Anchor School of Theology, uh, so we are going to just do the lessons that uh, were not done during the school. Uh, so the lesson that we're going to study today is number two, the parable of the sower. And uh, in the syllabus, it's found on page 13. I'd just like to mention that for those who are watching this program, I would highly recommend that you get a copy of the syllabus. We have a syllabus for this class that has 51 lessons on 51 parables and miracles and analogies uh, and allegories that Jesus used. So if you get the syllabus, it'll be a lot better because you'll be able to, um, you know, follow along and fill in the blanks and get a lot more out of the class. So before we begin, we want to have a word of prayer. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being here today. And we ask that as we study this very important lesson on the parable of the sower, that your spirit will be with us to guide our thoughts. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The first section of our syllabus is titled, The Field, the Sower, and the Soils. And uh, so we want to decipher some of the symbols that we find in this parable of the sower. So let's begin at number one. What is represented by the field in the parable of the sower? Well, the Bible tells us that the field represents the world. So uh, in this parable, the field, where you have uh, four different kinds of soils, represents the world. Number two, who is the sower in the parable of the sower? Well, uh, the sower, according to Matthew 13, verse 37, is the Son of Man. So the sower in the parable is Jesus. And then we have four kinds of soil in the field. Uh, and uh, what do these four kinds of soil represent in this parable? Well, we don't have to guess because Mark 4 verse 15 explains it. And these are they by the wayside. So it's speaking of one of the kinds of soil, the wayside soil. We'll come back to that later. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard... Satan comes immediately, and that's an important word, so the, the seed doesn't even have a chance to begin the germination process. Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. So you notice here that uh, the seed that falls by the wayside is actually falling on the heart. So the other soils must also represent human hearts. So the soils are symbolic. Now, let's take a look at what the seed represents. Uh, so we've noticed what the field represents. It's the world. The sower represents Jesus. And the soils represent four kinds of hearts. So let's take a look at the symbolism of the seed. What does the seed represent? Well, under number one, subtitle, the seed, we find in Luke chapter 8 and verse 11 that the seed represents the Word of God. Now, in the immediate context, we're talking not generally about the entire Word of God, although what uh, we find in this lesson is true of the entire uh, Word of God, but specifically, it's referring to the Word of Jesus in this particular parable. So, let's notice um, number two. Actually, let's read the note uh, under number one. We didn't read that. Uh, Ellen White explains in Christ Object Lessons, page 33, uh, that Jesus' parable teaching itself was the seed which the most precious truths of His grace were sown. So you'll notice here that uh, Jesus' parable teaching is specifically the seed that is being spoken of here uh, in this parable and in the other parables as well. Now let's go to number two. Uh, 1 Peter 1.23 explains also the meaning of the seed. So let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. It says there, um, Being born again, 
not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So you'll notice here that uh, the seed represents the word of God, because it says not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. So the seed represents the word of God. Uh, Number three, this is an interesting uh, concept, and that is that the planting of the literal seed is actually symbolic of the planting of the spiritual seed, and both of these have power within themselves to reproduce. Notice uh, what we find in Christ's Object Lessons, page 33. The same laws that govern earthly seed sowing govern the sowing of the seeds of truth. So what applies to literal seed sowing also applies to the sowing of the Word of God in human hearts. And uh, we're going to uh, add a few details to this. We're going to amplify it in the next few questions. Now, number four, this is on page 14. Jesus frequently told parables as the events were occurring. Now, when Jesus told the parable of the sower, where was he? Christ's Object Lessons, page 34. Upon hillside and plain, both sowers and reapers were busy, the one casting seed and the other harvesting the early grain. So as Jesus told this parable, there were sowers out there sowing, and there were reapers that were reaping. So the people could actually see an illustration of the parable that Jesus was telling. And we're going to find that in uh, most of the parables, Jesus is telling the parable as the events are occurring. Number five, the life-giving power of God's Word can be discerned in the following statement in Christ's Object Lessons, page 38. This is such a powerful concept. In every command... And in every promise of the Word of God is the power, the very life of God, by which the command may be fulfilled and the promise realized. He who by faith receives the Word in, uh, it, he, excuse me, he who by faith receives the Word is receiving the very life and character of God. So what this is telling us is, you know, you plant a seed and within the seed there is power to, for it to germinate and to grow and to bear fruit. The promises of God and the commands of God have that same power in them when they're planted in the heart to bear spiritual fruit. Now let's go to number six. What happens when the ideas of men are planted in the heart instead of the word of God? We find uh, this statement in Christ's Object Lessons, page 40. Philosophical theories or literary essays, however brilliant, cannot satisfy the heart. And the reason why is because they're the words of men. They're not the words of God. Only the words of God can fully satisfy the heart, not the words of men. Let's go to number seven. The Word of God has power within itself to help us overcome sin. In other words, when God gives a promise, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Within that promise is the power to accomplish what the promise says. It says there in Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So when we hide the word of God in our hearts, there is power in the word to give us victory over sin. So the Word of God is very powerful, just like the literal seed is very powerful, because in the literal seed there is power to germinate and to grow and to bear fruit. Number eight, through the prophet Isaiah, this is Isaiah 55 verse 11, God promises that as the seed bears bears fruit, and now I quote from Isaiah 55 verse 11, so shall my word that goeth out of my mouth be. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So when God speaks His Word, His Word accomplishes what the Word says. Uh, That's a very important concept. And so as you plant a literal seed, the literal seed accomplishes, because it has power in itself, 
what that seed was made for. Number nine, um, there is grave danger in setting aside the Word of God for, and now I quote Christ's Object Lessons, page 41, when the Word of God is set aside, its power to restrain the evil passions of the natural heart is rejected. Men sow to the flesh, and of the flesh they reap corruption. So you'll notice that if the Word of God is not planted in the heart, then it cannot restrain the evil passions of the natural heart. And of course, we just read a few minutes ago, Psalm 119, verse 11, where we are told, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. So uh, a great secret of, pow uh, uh, of the power to overcome sin is found in uh, planting the Word of God in our hearts by letting it come through our eyes and through our ears. Now, number 10, uh, in many of our schools, the literary products of great men of the world are emphasized. Um, is, is this uh, ideal, or should we focus more on the inspired writings? Well, um, Ellen White explains in Christ's Object Lessons, page 41, the following. In turning from God's Word to feed on the writings of uninspired men, the mind becomes dwarfed and cheapened. Wow, that's an incredible concept. That when you fill your mind with the writings of men that were not inspired, there's no power in that word. In other words, the word does not have power to accomplish that which is spoken. But um, with the word of God, when it's planted, because it's inspired, because it has the spirit, it is going to grow in our lives. So not only is it... Uh, no problem to read the uninspired uh, writings of men, but it actually dwarfs and cheapens the mind. Number 11, Ellen White explains the psychological process whereby the mind is dwarfed and cheapened. Now she's going to explain the process that is followed in cheapening the human mind when you dwell on the writings of uninspired men. She quotes in Christ's Object Lessons, page 41, the understanding adapts itself to the comprehension of the things with which it is familiar. And in this devotion to finite things, it is weakened, its power is contracted, and after a time it becomes unable to expand. Wow, what a concept. So in other words, our mind adapts to that which we put into our mind. So if we put in our minds the words of men, of uninspired men, the mind is going to be dwarfed. Whereas if we put the Word of God in our minds, our mind is going to expand according to what we are told in the Spirit of Prophecy. Number 12, in many of our schools, the study of the Bible is considered of secondary importance. This is tragic. And now I quote from Christ's Object Lessons, page 42, because there is nothing so ennobling and invigorating as a study of the great themes which concern our eternal life. So the Word of God has power within itself, and when it's planted in the heart, it gives us power as well. Number 13, it is not enough to teach the theoretical truths of the Word of God. Truth must be embodied. In other words, truth must be put in our body, in our mind, in our hearts. Of Christ it is said, and here's Christ's Object Lessons, page 43. Christ taught the truth because He was the truth. His own thought, His character, His life experience were embodied in His teaching. So when we assimilate the teachings of Christ, we are actually assimilating Christ. We assimilate Christ through a study of His Word. It's kind of like, you know, we are what we eat physically. And spiritually, we are what we eat spiritually. If we eat spiritual junk food, we'll have spir uh, spiritual junk health. If we eat the Word of God, we'll be healthy in terms of our spirituality. Now, let's take a look at the four different kinds of soil, the four kinds of soil uh, in the field, which is the world. First of all, the seeds by the wayside. That is the seeds that fall on the path where people walk. There are several questions under this section. Let's go to number one. Christ Object Lessons, page 44. The seed sown by the wayside represents the Word of God 
as it falls upon the heart of an inattentive hearer. And what is the result? The spiritual faculties are paralyzed. Men hear the word, but understand it not. In other words, the wayside hearers are those that hear the word and they reject it immediately. It doesn't even begin the process of germination. Let's read the note. The wayside represents, the wayside people represent those who have hearts of stone where it is impossible for the seed of truth to penetrate. Number two, the seeds by the wayside, according to the parable, are plucked by the birds. Now, what do the birds represent? The birds which pluck, pluck the seed away represent the devil. This is uh, Luke 8, verse 12. Who takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So the minute that the word falls on the heart, uh, Satan comes and he plucks away the seed, Satan and his angels. So the birds here represent the devil and his angels. And they take away the seed as soon as it falls so that it will not germinate and bear fruit in the life. Let's read the note. Concerning this, Ellen White wrote, As the birds are ready to catch up the seed from the wayside, so Satan is ready to catch away the seeds of divine truth from the soul. See, once again, the soil represents the soul or represents the heart. So she says, as the birds are ready to catch up the seed from the wayside, so Satan is ready to catch away the seeds of divine truth from the soul. Why does he do that? He fears that the word of God may awaken the careless and take effect upon the hardened heart. He's afraid that that hardened heart might become soft. So he says, let's pluck the seed as soon as it falls so that it doesn't even begin to germinate in the heart. Number three, among these inattentive hearers, are those who listen to the preaching of the Word of God and make it the subject of criticism at home. So people go to church, they hear the Word of God, and then they go home and they start criticizing. She continues, Christ's Object Lessons, page 45. They sit in judgment on the sermon as they would on the words of a lecturer or a political speaker. Often these things are spoken by parents in the hearing of their own children. Thus are destroyed respect for God's messengers and reverence for their message. What a powerful statement. Dangerous to go home, parents, and criticize the sermon that you heard, especially in the presence of your children. Because according to this statement, respect for the messenger and the message is destroyed. Number four. Here we have an example of a wayside hearer. Among the wayside hearers was Felix whom, after Paul had preached to him about righteousness, temperance, and judgment, said to him, now Felix says to Paul, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call thee. Acts 24, 25. According to the spirit of prophecy, the opportunity never came. That was the last chance. Number five, also King Agrippa is represented by the wayside hearers. Among the wayside hearers was also King Agrippa. After the Apostle Paul preached a powerful sermon to Agrippa, we're told in Acts 26, 27, and 28, that the king replied, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost saved is totally lost. Another group of individuals who are illustrated by the seed that fell by the wayside are the members of the Sanhedrin that stoned Stephen. We're told that after Stephen preached a powerful message, a powerful sermon, and now I quote from Acts 7 verse 54 and verse 57, that they gnashed on him with their teeth. In other words, they gritted their teeth and they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. In other words, they're covering their ears so they can't hear and ran upon him with one accord. The seed of Stephen's sermon fell on the path and did not even begin to germinate and obviously did not produce fruit. Number seven, in the end time we also have a group of wayside hearers. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 9 through 12, we are told that these wayside hearers did not love 
or believe the truth. This is number seven on page 15. They did not love or believe the truth. And therefore God will send them a strong delusion that they might believe the lie. Now we need to understand what is meant here by the lie. This is not talking about them accepting uh, different lies. It's talking about a specific lie. The context tells us that Satan is going to counterfeit the second coming of Christ. He's going to appear like Christ appeared when he was on the earth. And many people are going to be deceived as a result of that. That is the lie. Because they did not believe or love the truth, they will believe the lie of the counterfeit second coming of Christ. They will actually proclaim Satan to be the Christ. Very serious stuff. Now let's notice what is represented by the seed in the stony places. The seed in the stony places. There are two problems with this kind of soil in the stony places. Luke 8 verse 6 explains that this soil lacked moisture. And by the way, moisture is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So there's not much moisture in this soil. And then it has a second problem, according to Matthew chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Uh, it tells us that the, the seed in the stony places, the soil had no depth, depth of earth, earth. In other words, it had a very small layer of good soil. So you combine low moisture with very little good soil, and as a result, when the sun comes up, the plant is scorched. We're in number one of page 16. So what happens is because very little good soil and very little moisture, the result is that when the sun comes out, uh, the plant is scorched. Number two, in the people represented by this soil, Christ's Object Lessons, page 46, selfishness of the natural heart underlies the soil of good desires and aspirations. In other words, those represented by the soil, they have good aspirations, they have good desires, but self is underneath the little bit of good soil that they have in the heart. And of course, the roots of the plant cannot penetrate the rock, and therefore the plant eventually dies. Number three, in Christ's Object Lessons, page 46, we find this statement, this class may be easily convinced and appear to be bright converts, but they have only a superficial religion. In other words, they have uh, just a surface of good soil, underneath is the rock of self. Now let's read the note. These are the people who have a form of godliness, but lack the power thereof. They are half-hearted Christians. They want to serve Christ and self simultaneously. They serve Christ with a divided heart. And Jesus himself said that no man can serve two masters. Ellen White wrote a very solemn statement. It's found in the Spalding McGann collection, page 260. Half-hearted Christians are worse than infidels, for their deceptive words and non-committal position lead, may lead many astray. The infidel shows his colors. Now, the secular person shows who he is. It's obvious to everyone. But then she continues, the lukewarm Christian deceives both parties. He is neither a good worldling nor a good Christian. Satan uses him to do a work that no one else can do. In other words, he deceives both the secular, that he's a good person, and he also deceives the righteous, that he is in good and regular standing. Number four, Ellen White makes this awesome statement in Christ's Object Lessons, page 46, about the seed that falls in stony hearts. It is not because men receive the Word of God immediately, nor because they rejoice in it, that they fall away. Why do they fall away then? She continues, They do not consider what the Word of God requires of them. They do not bring it, that is the Word of God, face to face with all their habits of life and yield themselves fully to its control. So, you know, people can immediately receive the word and rejoice in the word and fall away. They don't fall away because they immediately received the word and they immediately rejoiced. In other words, the reason why is because they don't realize what the word requires of them. 
And when the word contradicts habits in their lives, they say, I don't want that. Let's read the note. Most of the disciples of Jesus left their professions immediately to joyfully follow Jesus. However, before they did, they considered the cost. This is why Jesus told Judas, who by the way, Jesus did not call Judas. Judas offered his services. This is why Jesus told Judas to count the cost before he decided to follow him. In Luke 9, 58, Jesus told Judas, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Judas chose to immediately follow Jesus, but he did not count the cost. The end result was suicide. Ananias and Sapphira also illustrate this category of soil. They tried to serve the Lord and serve mammon at the same time. Number five, what is represented by the sun scorching the seed that is planted in shallow soil with low moisture? We find the answer in Matthew 13, verse 21. The scorching sun which withers the plant represents tribulation and persecution that arise because of the word. In other words, uh, when people embrace the word, immediately you have family, you have friends that oppose you, you have persecution, and you have tribulations and problems in your lives. And those uh, individuals who are represented by the stony hearts, you know, they can't really tolerate tribulation and persecution. They thought that things were going to be easy. And when these problems come, they fall by the wayside. Let's read the note. Stony ground hearers are those who enthusiastically receive Christ in the good times. They expect that Christianity will spare them from trials and tribulations. While things go well, they appear to be good Christians. But when they are required to make a sacrifice for what they believe, they fall away. In Matthew 10, 34 to 39, Jesus warned that following him involved great sacrifices, yet in the end the dividends would be eternal. So we might have trials and tribulations in this life when the seed is planted in the heart. There might be opposition, but in the long run we will have eternal life and much more than what we had in this life. Number six on page 17. This kind of soil represents those who rejoice for a season. Not permanently, but for a season. For they think that religion will free them from difficulty and trial. This is from Christ's object lessons. But when, Christ, but when trials come, they faint beneath the fiery test of temptation. They cannot bear reproach for Christ's sake. When the Word of God points out some cherished sin or temptation or requires self-denial or sacrifice, they are offended. It would cost them too much effort to make a radical change in their lives. So these are people who make only a half-hearted commitment to Jesus Christ. When the Word comes, oh, they say all oh, the self-denial uh, is too much, the sacrifice is too much, and it's going to cost me uh, more than I can give. And so they fall by the wayside. Number seven, God cannot accept half a heart. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 48, we find the following statement. Christ asks for an unreserved consecration, for undivided service. Notice, unreserved and undivided. He demands the heart, the mind, the soul, the strength. Self is not to be cherished. He who lives to himself is not a Christian. Now what about the seed that fell among the thorns? Well, let's go to number one. When Adam and Eve sinned, the earth produced, according to Genesis chapter 3, verse 18, thorns and thistles. So thorns and thistles are the result of sin, according to the Bible. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 50, we find this amplified statement about the meaning of thorns and thistles. The thorns of sin will grow in any soil. They need no cultivation. The thorns that have been cut off but not uprooted 
grow apace until the soul is overspread with them. You do not need to cultivate weeds. You don't need to fertilize weeds. Weeds grow automatically, we might say. And so if we're going to uproot weeds, we can't just cut them down. We have to totally uproot the weed. And I don't know this from experience. We have a little garden in our backyard, and we constantly have to pull up weeds, or the weeds will totally overwhelm the good plants. Now let's go to number three. Uh, the seed among the thorns represents, of course, the uh, hearers who, um, who have all sorts of issues in their lives with thorns and thistles. Now let's go to number three. Thorn bearers face four dangers which are, now let's notice what the four dangers of uh, those individuals who have a heart where there are thorns. Four dangers are the cares of this world, number one, the deceitfulness of riches, number two, the pleasures of this life, number three, and lusts of other things. So let's take a look at uh, these, four, um, these four dangers that those who have hearts where the seed is planted among the thorns uh, face. Let's go to number four. Yielding to any of these four dangers brings disastrous results. I quote from Christ's Object Lessons, page 51, The soul ceases to draw nourishment from Christ and spiritually dies out of the heart. So you'll notice that the thorns eventually suffocate the, the good seed so that it does not bear fruit. Now, what is represented by the cares of this world? The first danger. Number five. The cares of this world could be described as the rat race of life. Ellen White explained in Christ's Object Lessons, page 51, but many become so absorbed in business that they have no time for prayer, no time for the study of the Bible, no time to seek and serve God. Three things, no time for prayer, no time for Bible study, no time to serve God. She continues, at times, the longings of the soul go out for holiness in heaven. Sometimes people long for holiness in heaven, she says. But there is no time to turn aside from the din of the world to listen to the majestic and authoritative utterances of the Spirit of God. In other words, these are people who are busy, busy, busy. No time for prayer, no time for service of God, no time for the study of the Bible, always involved in some kind of activity. Page 18. This is question number six or statement number six, rather, Jesus spoke about these kind of people who are always fretting and worrying about the cares of this life and the need to make ends meet. Uh, in Matthew 6, verse 25, we find the words of Jesus where he stated to people, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not life more than meat and the body than raiment? And then he gives examples like, for example, can you add uh, several inches to your stature just by worrying? Of course not. Uh, and, and then he goes on in verse 31. He uh, makes that famous statement that many people know, or probably most everybody. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. In other words, don't fret about the daily activities and the business of life, how you're going to make ends meet. No, focus on the kingdom of God and its righteousness first, and then all of these things will be added unto you. It's a matter of priorities, in other words. Now let's notice question number seven, or statement number seven. The deceitfulness of riches, now we turn to the second danger of this kind of soil. Uh, the deceitfulness of riches was manifested in the rich young ruler. He wanted eternal life, but he thought the cost was too great. He went away sad because he had many possessions, according to Matthew 19, verses 16 to 21. He's an illustration where riches, actually the thorns of riches, if you please, 
uh, actually killed the seed so that it would not grow and produce fruit. Number eight, the Apostle Paul well knew the dangers of riches. Now, riches uh, are not, having riches is not a sin. The sin is when you covet riches or when you love riches more than you love God and you hoard riches. Let's notice what the Apostle Paul had to say. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And then here comes the key statement. For the love of money is the root of all evil. So it's not money. It is the love of money or the coveting of money that is the root of all evil. And we can certainly see that in the world today. Uh, the Apostle Paul continues, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, in other words, they've left the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So many leave the faith as a result of the riches, the love for riches, uh, actually killing the seed that wants to grow in the heart. Now Ellen White also commented about the dangers which rich people face uh, in Christ's Object Lessons, page 52. And I quote, They lose the sense of their dependence upon God and their obligation to their fellow men. In other words, riches are meant to bless others, not to bless ourselves. That doesn't mean that we, uh, that we have to be homeless. We can definitely have our home and we can have a car and we can make ends meet. But what it means is that we should not hoard like the man who built uh, ever bigger barns. You know, instead of uh, taking his produce and uh, using it to benefit others, he said, let me big, build bigger barns and bigger barns and bigger barns to store my goods. In other words, he was a hoarder. So she continues, the lo they lose the sense of their dependence upon God and their obligation to their fellow men. Instead of regarding wealth as a talent to be employed for the glory of God and the uplifting of humanity, they look upon it as a means of serving themselves. And I would say that there are many, many Christians today and many ministers today who suffer from this deadly disease of coveting riches. Now what about the statement, the pleasures of life? This is the a third uh, danger of those who have this kind of soil that has thorns. Let's notice number 10. The pleasures of this life are a real danger to the soul. Christ's Object Lessons, page 53. There is danger in amusement that is sought merely for self-gratification. So notice, the pleasures of this life are the amusement that is sought merely for self-gratification. She continues, All habits of indulgence that weaken the physical powers, that becloud the mind, or that benumb the spiritual perceptions, are fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Powerful statement. So once again, all habits of indulgence that weaken the physical powers, that becloud the mind, or that benumb the spiritual perceptions, are fleshly lusts which war against the soul. In other words, everything, anything that goes against our physical, mental, and spiritual health is uh, something that will eventually lead to the killing of the seed that is planted in the heart. Let's notice the note. It is recommended that everyone prayerfully study the following passages, 1 John 2, 15 to 17, and Luke 21, 34 to 36. The passage in 1 John 2, 15 to 17 speaks of three things that uh, characterize those who do not truly love Jesus. They lust, they, they practice the lust of the flesh, the lust of the life, and the pride of life. Number 11. Parents face a real danger in this respect. Many parents, and this is Christ's Object Lessons, page 54, many parents seek to promote the happiness of their children by gratifying their love of amusement. They allow them to engage in sports and to attend parties of pleasure 
and provide them with money to use freely in display and self-gratification. They form habits of idleness and self-indulgence that makes it almost impossible for them ever to become steadfast Christians. So someday the Lord is going to require an accounting from parents on how they taught their children these things that we're talking about here in this session. Number 12, youth that are led down this road by their parents, and now I quote from Christ's Object Lessons, page 55, may see their folly and repent. Children might see their folly and repent, she says. God may pardon them, but they have wounded their own souls and brought upon themselves a lifetime, lifelong peril. They, the power of discernment, their power of discernment, which ought ever to be kept keen and sensitive to distinguish between right and wrong, is in a great measure destroyed. Wow, what a statement. In other words, they're wounded for life. And uh, their power of discernment is affected. Their ability to distinguish between right and wrong is to a great measure destroyed. Number 13, we have the fourth danger of the thorny uh, ground hearers. It's called the lusts for other things. And we'll have just one uh, statement on this, page 19 of the syllabus. Among the lust of other things, Ellen White identifies, and I quote, the exciting sports, theater going, horse racing, gambling, liquor drinking, and reveling. Those who learn to love amusement for its own sake open the door to a flood of temptations. So that is the lust of other things. So the seed that is planted there where there are thorns uh, is, uh, represents those individuals who, uh, you know, they hoard riches, they enjoy the pleasures of this life instead of glorifying God and helping their fellow man, and they are so concerned about the, the activities of this life, they have no time to pray, they have no time for Bible study, to serve others, and then they have the lusts of other things such as Theater going, horse racing, gambling, liquor drinking, reveling, etc. Now, we want to end this lesson on a good note. The fourth kind of soil, the good ground hearers. This is on page 19 of the syllabus, number one. The good ground hearers are described as those who have an honest and good heart. And having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. <laughs> Several concepts here. They're honest in heart. They hear the word. They not only hear the word, they keep the word and they bring forth fruit, but bringing forth fruit takes patience. You know, you don't harvest tomatoes the same day that you plant them. It takes a long process of fertilizing and watering and pulling weeds and cultivating in other words, uh, those who have the good seed planted in their hearts, you know, they persevere until the end. They hear the word and they keep it. Number two, the good ground hearer has an honest heart who yields to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He confesses his guilt and feel, he feels his need of the mercy and love of God. He has a sincere desire to know the truth. And now notice the final part of this statement. To know the truth that he may obey it. So it's not the hearers only. It is the doers according to this. Now there's an individual who is characterized by this kind of soil. The good soil. His name was Cornelius, a Roman centurion. When he and his friends visited the apostle Peter, he said, Now therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God? In other words, we want to hear everything that God has commanded and we are willing to obey everything that God commanded. Number four, the angels are involved in the process of planting the seed and helping the seed grow. 
In Christ's Object Lessons, page 59, we find these words. To those who in humility of heart seek for divine guidance, angels of God draw near. The Holy Spirit is given to open to them the rich treasures of the truth. Now what is meant by the fruit? Number five, Christ's Object Lessons, page 60. Those who, having heard the word, keep it, bring forth fruit in obedience. So notice, they hear the word, they keep the word, and this bears the fruit of obedience. The statement continues, the word of God received into the soul will be manifest in good fruit. So the fourth soil, the good soil, is that when the seed is planted, the individual, the seed of truth is planted in the heart, the individual actually obeys the word, and as a result, the word produces fruit. Number six, the Apostle Paul encourages Christians to walk in the Spirit. This means that they have fruit of, and now you have the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, you have as a result love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. So when the seed of truth of God's Word is planted in the heart, in its good soil, it produces the fruit of the Spirit. It gives you a life of love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Number seven, we are told that the Word of God often comes in collision with man's hereditary and cultivated traits of character. So you'll see the Word of God sometimes is in conflict with our cultivated and our inherited uh, traits of character. But then she explains what happens with the good ground hearer. But the good ground hearer, in receiving the Word, accepts all its conditions and requirements. His habits customs and practices are brought into submission to God's Word. So in other words, no excuse saying, well, you know, I inherited this tendency from my parents, or, uh, you know, I lived in a bad environment. No, there's no excuse by the good ground hearers. The good ground hearers, they put their life in submission to God's Word, even if God's Word is contrary to their inherited and cultivated tendencies. Number eight. Jesus made a beautiful promise in John 14, verse 23. This is His promise. If a man love me, he will keep my words. So notice, if we love Jesus, we're not only going to hear His word, we are going to keep His words. And then uh, Jesus continues, And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So in other words, the good ground hearers are the ones that love Jesus and they keep the words of Jesus as a result. Now we're on page 20, page number 20, uh, and we'll deal just for a moment with the book of Revelation. You know, in the introduction to the book of Revelation and in the conclusion of the book of Revelation, we find an interesting formula. And uh, you can read it in Revelation 1, verse 3, and Revelation chapter 22, and verse 7. It refers to the entire book. It says there that those who read, hear, and keep the words of the book have a special blessing pronounced upon them. So it's not enough to read. It's not enough to hear which means to pay attention to what you're reading, it is necessary to keep the words of the book. And if we keep the words of the book, then we are good ground hearers. Now let's go to number 10. James warns us about being forgetful hearers of the word. This is in James 1 verses 22 to 24. He states, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. 
So when we're hearers of the word alone, but we're not doers of the word, we are deceiving our own selves. The statement continues, For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner he was. In other words, this is a case of you going and looking in the mirror, and you see in your face defects, in your face you know that needs to be washed and cleansed, and uh, you simply leave and you forget what the mirror told you. That's uh, the, the characteristic of the person who hears the word of God and doesn't do it. You know, the word speaks to that person, that person leaves, doesn't obey, doesn't clean his face, in other words, with the water, which would be a symbol of the Holy Spirit, and he forgets what his face was like. Now let's go to number 11. Fruit is not produced overnight. It is a long process which requires toil and patience. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 61, we find these words. The Christian is to wait with patience for the fruition in his life of the Word of God. And I once again repeat that you do not harvest the same day that you plant. You know, you plant the seed, you have to, you have, to have good soil, you have to have fertilizer, then the seed germinates, you have the little plant, you have to make sure that you pull the weeds, that you continue watering, that you continue fertilizing, and then the plant grows, you need to make sure that it has enough sunshine, and uh, then after a long process of patient caring for the seed, then the seed grows into a plant or into a tree and eventually produces fruit. And this is what the Christian life is like. The Christian life is not many times easy. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of care. But in the end, all of the care is worth it because in this way, the life will produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, the good news is that the soil of the human heart can be changed. Some person might say, well, you know, I, my heart is like the, uh, like the wayside. You know, that's the way I was born, so... I can't change that fact. Or other people might say, well, you know, uh, I got a stony heart and that's the way it has to be. Uh, or, you know, I have a heart where you have all these thorns that want to take over the seed. I can't help it. That's the kind of heart that I received. Uh, no, that's not the way it works. The Bible tells us that we can change through the power of the Holy Spirit the soil of our heart. We're not stuck with the, with the heart that we have. It can be changed. Let's notice number one under... Uh, page 20, under the subtitle, The Soil of the Heart Can Be Changed. This is a beautiful promise that the Lord makes in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verses 26 and 27. See, God is the great cardiologist, spiritual cardiologist. You know, God does not uh, do bypass surgery. God does not do uh, changes of valves. God doesn't put pacemakers in our heart. God actually does only one kind of surgery, and that kind of surgery is heart transplants. He will only take out a whole old stony heart, or a heart that has uh, thorns, or a heart that uh, is in the stony places, and he will place in a good heart that can bear fruit. Notice Ezekiel chapter 36 and verses 26 and 27. Beautiful promise. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Notice God says, I'm going to give you a new heart. Not repair the old heart, but give you a new heart and a new spirit. And then uh, the prophet continues saying, under inspiration, God is speaking, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments to do them. Notice, doing is the fruit, but in order to do, 
God must give us a heart transplant. He must place the Holy Spirit within our hearts. I'd like to end by mentioning one individual whose heart was changed. There are many others in the Bible, but this is a striking example. You remember Saul of Tarsus. He was the ringleader uh, in those who were stoning Stephen, the first Christian martyr. He was encouraging them. In fact, he had Stephen's, uh, he had their clothes there uh, at his feet. And, uh, and he was uh, encouraging them to stone the stones and to stone this man who had preached this powerful sermon. And, um, and so at this stage, Saul of Tarsus has a heart of stone because he was there with those who gnashed with their teeth and, you know, their heart was raging within them and they all went after him in one accord. He was on the same page. But then on the road to Damascus, Saul of Tarsus met Jesus. And Jesus asked him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he answered Jesus, who, who are you so that I can know who I'm persecuting? And Jesus answered, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And to make a long story short, Saul of Tarsus was converted on the road to Damascus. And he became the great champion of the gospel to the Gentiles. Who knows how many millions of individuals are going to be saved in the kingdom as a result of the ministry and the writings of the Apostle Paul. Yes, his heart was a hard heart. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, circumcised the eighth day, concerning the law, blameless. But he later said, I consider all of this rubbish in order to win Christ. So his heart became a good soil heart. And praise the Lord, someday he and Stephen are going to meet in the kingdom. That will be some encounter. Because Stephen, when he was stoned, did not know that Saul of Tarsus was converted and would become the great champion to the Gentiles. Imagine what that encounter between Stephen and Saul will be when Stephen sees Saul of Tarsus saved in the kingdom. I'm sure he won't hold it against him. He will embrace him and say, Saul! You also were saved in the kingdom. My death was worth it. My death testified to Christ. And eventually you gave your heart to the Lord. So the heart can be changed. The soil that you have can be changed. As long as you are willing to submit to Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you invite the Holy Spirit to abide permanently in your heart. Then you will produce fruit abundantly for God's honor and glory.